person here. <laughs> and Lord bless you as you Thanks. minister to us this morning. Thank you kindly. It's got to find some power here. Just one moment, please. So, there was a, there was an elderly lady, quite distinguished looking. <laughs> That's not the funny part yet. <laughs> I'm kidding that came through the door of a, a church one Sunday morning. And, uh, and one of the ushers at the church noticed this, this visitor. And so he rushed to her and he said, ma'am, he said, would you take my arm? And he said, I'm going to lead you and sit you down in our sanctuary. She said, oh, thank you. Very this, is, this is my old lady imitation. Oh, thank you very much. She said, I'd like to sit right in the front row because she said, my pastor, uh, sorry, my son is the pastor. Uh, you know what? I said this out of order. <laughs> no, I'm not nervous. <laughs> she came through the door. He grabbed her by the arm. She said, I would like to go and sit right in the front row. The usher said to her, you don't want to sit in the front row. Our pastor's kind of long, and he's kind of boring. And she said, do you know that the pastor is my son? She said, do you know who I am? I'm his mother. He said, I didn't know that. Do you know who I am? She said, no, I don't. He said, good. <laughs> That's the icebreaker, even though I messed it up. <laughs> okay. Well, good morning, folks. And uh, it really is, it's good to be back uh, in our home church for Lori and I. We've been away for a little while, and uh, uh, as always, it's just good to be back into our home church here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Len Ligi, my wife Lori, and we, uh, we've been members of this church for 20-some-odd years, and so this is where we come to worship from Sunday to Sunday. And um, we've been away out to the East Coast uh, for the birth of our, our second grandson. And uh, what a special time that it was <laughs> for us. So it was really, uh, it was a tough thing to, 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 to want to come back here because we really wanted to be back here to stay out there. Lori was out there for a whole month, me not quite as long. Uh, uh, but it truly is uh, good to be back here. So I'd like to welcome each and every one of you of our own home church family. Welcome. Uh, if you're visiting this morning, uh, welcome. And if you may even be on holidays and decided to visit with us today, and we welcome you too. And that is the case with our pastor this morning. He's on holiday. So if you're wondering, why is Len up here <laughs> going to speak this morning when our pastor, who does such a marvelous job, is sitting in the congregation? It's because Pastor Patrick is on holidays. And so it is, I am honored, I am honored to be able to come here and to be able to bring the Word of God to you this morning. Uh, in the presence of our pastor. The speaking that I do is just something that I'm willing to do. I am not an ordained minister. I don't ever plan to become one. <laughs> I'm just willing to do this. And uh, I just believe uh, that the Lord would have me to kind of uh, chip in in this way. And so, uh, so here we are. So without further ado, um, my text this morning is, going, is found in the book of James. And... Uh, it's James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now James, the, the reason I'm speaking about this particular topic is because I've just finished studying it and it's very, very fresh in my mind. So I thought, I'm going to elaborate on one of the things that really, really touched my heart. And so this message is for me as much as it is for any one of you, believe me. It's for me as much as it is for any one of you. Um, the text is, uh, as I said, James chapter 3, verses 1 through uh, 12. And so um, this is kind of a new custom for our church. And our pastor has us stand up when he reads the Word of God usually. And so I'm going to ask you to do that because I, I love that. I love that idea of just uh, uh, standing up before the Lord as we uh, read His Word. And so I'll begin. And it's about the taming of the tongue. Not many of you should presume to be teachers my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. 
We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a very small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let's pray. Our dear Lord and precious Heavenly Father, I just pray. Um, I pray, pray, Lord, that it is you, that it is your Holy Spirit that speaks uh, today, Lord. Uh, just fill my heart and uh, uh, give me the words, Lord, uh, to say what you would have to say to we, the, the people, this morning, Lord. Lord, it is such an honor to be in your house this morning, in a country that is free to do so, because we know that that's not the case in many, many, many places of our world today. And so, Lord, we thank you in advance for what you, uh, for what you have for us this day, and uh, we, we just look really forward, Lord, into spending a little bit of time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So James jumps right into a real meaty topic here, a real meaty idea, right from the very beginning of chapter 3. And it almost, to me, seems like a kind of a, kind of a warning, or at least a, a heads up uh, to the reader of this particular letter, and obviously to us who, who are reading this letter today. And the heads up is this. Don't become too eager, or maybe too hasty in wanting to become teachers of God's word. Now, we all need to proclaim God's word, but we aren't all called to be teachers. We're not all called to do this. King James, uh, uh, King James Version says, uh, don't be too hasty to become masters of God's word. Doesn't actually use the word tongue. James doesn't here. But we understand that in any kind of teaching ministry or talking ministry, that the tongue or the words that we say, the words that we choose to use, do become very, very important. Has the teacher who is delivering the words had the life-changing experience of having Jesus come and live inside of his heart? That's the question that we need to ask as people sitting out there. Has that person who deems himself qualified or whatever for bringing God's word to you and to me had the life-changing experience of having Jesus come live in his heart or her heart? Is the way that that person lives constantly and continuously being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Savior? That's a question that you can ask yourself. I think that James is telling us to not take a teaching, talking ministry too lightly because those that engage in these talking types of ministries may be subjected to a more severe judgment than the rest of us. Right? I'm going to lead you to salvation. I'm going to show you the way. And I need to know what I'm talking about a little bit. Therefore, the necessity... The necessity 
of speaking God's word. And you know what? You can't go wrong with God's word because it is the truth. It's the truth. Therefore, the importance of practicing what you teach. And that also becomes very important when you're down there trying to witness somebody sitting at Tim Hortons having a coffee and you want to talk about Jesus. (laughs) Because that's not what we see all the time. But you need to make sure that Jesus is seen in your life. And often the way Jesus is seen in your life is by the words that you choose to say. This is what one man said. Forget who the guy was. The extent of my influence on you will probably be determined by how much I myself have progressed. I'm going to say that one more time. The extent of my influence on you will probably be determined by how much I myself have progressed. And how much I have progressed is often displayed in the words that are spoken from my very mouth. What we say tells a lot about ourselves. What we say to others. We are talking about the tongue this morning and the taming of the tongue. James goes on to say that if a man doesn't stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, and that that man is able to keep his whole body in check. He doesn't stumble over what he says. He's able to keep his whole body in check. My prayer is, O oh Lord, that, we, we, that we, we, the Christian community, would become men, women, and children, believers that can keep their whole body in check for him, for Christ Jesus, including or maybe especially keeping our tongues in check watching what we say to one another and about others. God's grace, God's grace should be so displayed in you and me and seen and sensed in our words. That is a very important factor. May you and I as believers and followers of Christ, may our consciences be affected by the sins of the tongue. May our consciences be affected by the sins of the tongue. May we repent of the sins of our tongue. And may we repent of the sins uh, of sorry. May we always be aware of the power that your tongue has. Lord, make me aware all the time of the power that, that my tongue has. The power of the words that come from me. May, may I be aware of that all the time so that I can use that for good. So James goes on in this chapter, um, with chapter 3, uh, uh, and he uses a couple of uh, illustrative comparisons here. I'm going to read over again James 3 uh, to 5a, um, and it says this, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. When we put a bit in a horse's mouth, we can turn the whole animal. Or take a ship as an example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it makes great boasts. So James is speaking here of putting a bit in a horse's mouth. That very large, usually, very strong, powerful animal can be somewhat controlled to obey the person that's leading it or riding it because of the fact that this bit is in its mouth. And I think, it's, I think what James has in mind here is that it's the power of the horse that is compared to the power of our tongue. The power of our tongue's need is to be bridled. Our tongues need to be bridled. Controlled and disciplined are other words that would come to mind for me. When the rider gets on the horse without a bit in its mouth, without the reins, what's going to happen? <laughs> That's not always pretty. Who knows what to expect from the horse? He's not under any discipline. But if it's bridled, there is control, and the animal is now under discipline. So this brings me to a story about myself. <laughs> so, so I'm from Espanola, about an hour down the road. Espanola, Ontario. And, uh, and so uh, my, my mother's parents, Grandpa and Grandma Hayes, who are no longer with us, Grandpa, Grandpa lived to 85 years of age, was a hard-working farmer, 
And Grandma lived to 99, who was a hard-working farmer's wife, <laughs> who raised seven children. My mother was the oldest of those, of those children. So it was very customary for us on Sunday afternoons. Uh, I wish I could say after service, but, but our, my family wasn't a church-going family so much. We, we weren't. So, but Sunday afternoon, we, we, we would jump in, in, the, uh, in the 1960s rendition of the SUV called the Station Wagon. Anybody remember that? The Station Wagon. My dad had a 61 Ford Falcon, and it was the ugliest brown color that you could ever think of. If, anyway. And the back seat went down, and so there was this great big area, and that's where the five of us got into when we were heading out to the farm. So there, there weren't even seat belts in it. <laughs> there, there weren't even seat belts in that car. So anyway, what were we thinking back in the 60s, right? So we'd jump, into this, we'd jump into this car, we'd head down to the farm, which was probably about a, a 15, minute, 15 or 20 minute drive from home. And it was in a place called Lee Valley, where my mom was born, which is just a little valley southwest of Espanola. And, and it was an old gravel road, you know, okay? And so we would drive, uh, you know, are we there yet? 20 minutes, <laughs> whatever. And then, and then so, so we, would, we would be coming, we, we'd round this corner and then we could see my grandparents' little house way off in the field there. And so you have to understand that this farm was a, was a very crude farm. It had no electricity. It had no running water. The, the, only, the only water was when my mom was running with the bucket <laughs> to the front of the well. That later on, the grandpa installed a, a hand pump in, in the kitchen for my grandmother, and she was like, oh, wow. Like that, that was amazing. Yeah, this hand pump, it was awesome. And, uh, and there was a great big cook stove in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, the, the kitchen, a three-room house, two bedrooms, and a kitchen. So you know where you went to the bathroom. But anyway. So we would, we, would, we would round the corner, and so we couldn't text Grandpa and say, we're just about here, or anything like that. So he, he knew by, by this big old brown station wagon coming down the road that, oh, oh they're here. You know, they're here. And so it, it would seem that my Grandpa would be waiting either outside by the door. He, he was a big man. He was like six foot five, big, big, big tall man, hard, hard working man. No Massey Ferguson tractor there, no, no John Deere or anything like that. What he had were two humongous big workhorses, and he had a plow. And I remember the, names, the name of the horses. They were called Prince and Dan. The two horses were, were Prince and Dan. And he was always there, my grandfather was always there to greet us and say, oh, you know, welcome, it's good to see you. And there, there weren't many hugs. We weren't that kind of a family, but he would say, you guys go out and play, but stay out of the pasture. The pasture? Stay out of the pasture. Don't go near Prince and Dan. Because they had, they had legs on them and feet like, like that. They, they, were, they were huge. And I mean, of course, I was like just little, so they probably seemed even bigger. But they were massive horses. And, and I would dare to say that one of the reasons my Grandpa Hayes said that was because it would have been very easy for one of us little kids to get stuck between a fence post and this horse or one of these horses and the, and the horse might not even know that he, that he was harming you. They, they were so big and strong and powerful. That's what I think. And it's pretty cool the way James uses that as an analogy. The power of the tongue compared to a, a, a big beast such as one of those horses. That's how powerful our words can be. That's how powerful the power of our tongue is sometimes. That's just an old story about part of my life. Question. Is your tongue under the control? Is your tongue under control and discipline? Is your tongue bridled this morning? The way Grandpa Hayes used to bridle those those big old horses. I, I, I hope, I hope that, that they are. And, and you know what? I can say this because I'm just a lay person like, like you guys are. Mine all, isn't always. And that's why I said at the outset that <laughs> this message is as much for me as it is for anybody else. It may even be just for me. I don't, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. 
And if your tongue is under some kind of control and or discipline, who is it that is disciplining it? Is it, is it Christ Jesus? That's, that's what the hope is. So another comparison, another comparison, James goes on, is that of a big, a big ship. The rudder, comparatively small to the size of the whole ship, can dictate which way that great big ship can go. A fellow by the name of William, William MacDonald brings, brings some perspective to this idea. And he talks about the Queen Elizabeth. So don't go and Google the Queen Elizabeth and say, Land, all of your stats were wrong because there was more than one Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> okay? And the, the, the Queen Elizabeth, I believe, that exists now is actually a, a cruise ship. The one that William MacDonald was talking about, it wasn't. It was a passenger ship, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a cruise ship. So it was a bit smaller than this cruise ship that, that exists today. Um, he points this out. The Queen Elizabeth weighed 86,000... 673 gross tons. 86,673 gross tons. The rudder, the rudder on that ship weighed 140 tons. So that's less than two tenths of 1% of the total weight of the whole ship. That's how much the rudder weighed. Less than two tenths of 1% of the whole ship. Yet, that um, relatively small device, by comparison to the size of the whole ship, was able to control where the ship went. Right? Comparatively speaking. I know 140 tons seems like a lot, and, and it is a lot, but not compared to 86,676 tons. Likewise, likewise, though the tongue is comparatively small to the overall size of the whole body, it is very powerful, and its power should never, ever be under, underestimated. Granted, our words can, can do a lot of good, and I've heard a lot of good words come from, from this pulpit in, in, in the last while and, and, and from this church, and that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But they can also do a lot of harm. Therefore, the need always to be in control your tongue. One, one more comparison, and it'll be the last one. James goes on to compare the power of the tongue to that of a, of a fire. And to me, his words are, are, aren't very flattering. <laughs> James is, uh, I said Paul, did I? James's words are not very flattering. Uh, James 3, 5b and, and 6 says this, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil, James's words here, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, well, sorry, the whole person, and sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Whew, James, <laughs> what, what are you trying to say? <laughs> James re is reminding us that it takes a relatively little wee spark to start a great forest fire. And that forest fire can burn completely out of control, devouring and killing everything in its, in its path. One, one little, little spark can do that. And if you're American and you know anything about California, right, the fires that they, they've had there in recent years and the devastation that it's caused, is, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And you know what? It all started by a little spark. And, and, and even more recently in, in Canada, in Alberta, a couple of years ago, up in Fort McMurray there, same thing. Devast, total devastation. One little spark. That's what it caused. Do our words have that kind of power? Do our words have that kind of power? Can one little comment, one little negative comment, cause that kind of upheaval or havoc or whatever word you want to choose here? If I'm understanding God's word correctly this morning, then the answer is yes. It says the tongue is also, uh, also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It, the tongue, corrupts the whole person, 
sets the whole course of his life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Our tongue can do that. Our tongue can do that. Remember that evil speaking, we'll call it evil speaking, gossip, I guess is another, another term, spreads just like that flame does. And, and again, I quote Bill McDonald. He says this about how gossip spreads. Two women conversing. Lost my spot here. Tilly told me that you told her that secret I told you not to tell her. The other one replies, Oh, she's a mean thing, that Tilly. I told Tilly not to tell you I told her. The other responds, Well, I told Tilly I wouldn't tell you that she told me, so don't tell her I did. <laughs> oh, the perils of the tongue. <laughs> the perils of the tongue. It can indeed defile and corrupt the whole body, just as James tells us in, in the book of James that it can. Our whole personality can become tarnished by the very words that we choose to speak. We do well by choosing to not lie, not slander. We can lose the swearing or the cursing. Sometimes we, don't, we shouldn't even talk in defense of ourselves. Because if I remember correctly, and I'm not going to give you the passages, you can look them up yourself if you want to, but there were times when Jesus, our Savior, said nothing. Didn't even open his mouth. Just let them talk. Is God's grace seen and sensed and heard in your words this morning? Or do we start another forest fire when we speak? Do we assassinate someone else's character just because ours has been? Or do we leave it in the hands of God and say nothing? Are our words set on fire by hell? Are the words we say, do, do they come from the enemy of our soul? And come from hell? Like, John alluded, or like, uh, like uh, James alluded to here? Or do they come from heaven? Are we influenced by what Jesus' word says? Are, the, are your words and my words uplifting? Are your words and my words encouraging? And are your words and my words truthful? Is the truth of the gospel in them? James 3, 7 and 8 say this. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea, they're being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. Verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. <whistles> James tells us that all kinds of animals and birds, birds and reptiles, etc. can be tamed by a man, but no man can tame the tongue. We've all been to the circus, and we've all seen the lion jump through the burning hoop, right? He's, he's, been, he's been trained, and he's been tamed somewhat, even though it's with a whip, maybe in most cases, or in some cases, to jump through that hoop of fire. We can tame animals. We've all seen, the, or maybe we haven't, I think I did once, might have been dreaming, a bear r ride a bicycle. You know, bear ride a bicycle. They can be trained to do that, tamed enough to be able to do that. What about the killer whale? We've all been to Marine Land. That poor unsuspecting soul sitting in the sitting in the front row where the guy comes and says, You stand on that platform and this gazillion pound killer whale. And, and, and the operative word here is killer, <laughs> jumps up out of the water and kisses that unsuspecting person right on the, right on the cheek. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if I'm a killer whale, I'd probably just as soon eat that person than kiss it. <laughs> but it has been somewhat tamed and trained to do what it is told or instructed to do. And in this case, it's probably coaxed by some poor, unsuspecting fish that's going to be his, <laughs> his, his meal after <laughs> for, for doing that. But animals can, can be trained. We can, we can train them. We can tame them. But um, James's word says that the tongue 
no man, no man can tame. I would suggest to you this morning that it takes something far greater, that it would take something far greater than just a man to tame your tongue and to tame my tongue. It would take something greater than just a man. James doesn't say that the tongue cannot be tamed. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that the tongue cannot be tamed. What he does say is no man can tame it. Verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. What about divine intervention? Where it comes to our, our speech. What about divine intervention? What about God the Father? This is what our church preaches here. What about God the Son who is Jesus? What about God the Holy Spirit? The tri that triune God. Can he help in taming the tongue? Emphatically, yes, he can. God can do that for you. God can do that for me. The taming of the tongue takes God's supernatural grace to intervene for you and for me. The taming of the tongue takes God's Holy Spirit power to tame. And the taming of the tongue takes the cross of Christ. I hope this church always preaches Christ. As the place to leave all of your evil speaking and all of your sins of the tongue. Because that's where he paid for it. That's where Christ paid for it. We need to pray for divine help in the taming of our tongues. Learn to pray for divine help and divine awareness to sometimes keep our mouths closed and let our tongues not be active before it spews out the deadly poison that it is, it is capable of doing. The, the things that we say have an effect on the people around us and it has an effect on the circumstances around us, for good or for bad. That's just the way it is. Verses 9 says, With the tongue we praise God, we pra sorry, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we also curse men. We, who, men who, have been made in God's own likeness. Out of the same mouth come, comes praise and cursing. James says, brothers, this should not be. You know your Bible. That's awesome. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. That's what our tongues are capable of doing. They're capable of, on the one hand, blessing God. And we just did that. Beautiful song leading today, girls. That, that was a wonderful time of worship. And that's what our tongues can do. We, we can bless God with our tongues. But boy, just as fast, and on the other hand, we can curse men, and we do sometimes, men that are made in God's own likeness. James says, no way, no way. He says, how can this be? Blessing and cursing com coming from the same source. Salt water and fresh water can't come from the same source. It's just not possible. How is it then that blessing and cursing can come from the same source? James says, these things ought not to be so. That's the King James Version. These things should not be. That's the NIV Version. I think that the very fact that the tongue is capable of doing this, blessing and cursing, solidifies the idea that divine intervention is necessary in the taming of the tongue. Some of the greatest sins of gossip can take place. I'm not saying they do, but can take place around the buffet table right after the church service. <laughs> Some of the conversations that we indulge in. We just spent an hour and a half praising God in music, listening to an awesome sermon, <laughs> praying for one another, as, as Bernard did this morning for us. And, go and then go right moments after that in, indulge in talk that is just not bringing any kind of glory to God. I'm going to leave you with a few, a few Bible passages. 
that are just going to back up a little bit of what, of what I had to say. Not, not, there, there are a few here, but I would really like for you to, to hear them. And so I'm going to probably go pretty fast. So I, I don't know if you'll be able to keep up here or not. But uh, anyway, take my word <laughs> for it. I'm going to be reading God's word. Okay. Again, out of the NIV. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 11 says this. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. But violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. Verse 14 of the same chapter. Wise men store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. In verse 19 of that same chapter, it says, When words are many, sin is not absent. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. Proverbs 11 and verse 9. With the mouth, the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous, the, uh, the righteous escape. Verse 11 of the same chapter. Through the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is destroyed. Just about done here. Proverbs 13 and 3 say this. He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. One more, Proverbs 17 and verse 20 says, a man of, preser uh, sorry, a man of perverse heart does not prosper, but he whose tongue is deceitful falls into trouble. And you knew I was coming to this. What did Jesus have to say? What did Jesus have to say about our talking and about the tongue? So we'll scoot on over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 37. Matthew 12, 34 through 37 says this. Jesus' words, not mine. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow, and we're getting to the crux of the matter here, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word that they have spoken. So we will be accountable for what we say. Be sure of that. And as I said, they're not my words. These are Christ's words. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The late, and in my mind, great Oswald Chambers said this, and I quote, from his book called Biblical Psychology. This is what Oswald Chambers says. If I want to know what my heart is like, let me listen to myself in an unguarded frame for five minutes. If I want to know what my heart is like, let me listen to myself in an unguarded frame for five minutes. Might be surprised what comes out of you. I think that that's kind of what Jesus was saying in Matthew 34 to 37. Another Bible verse, Jesus' words, 50, uh, Matthew 15 and verse 11 says this <clears throat> What goes into the man's mouth does not make him unclean. What goes into a man's mouth doesn't make him unclean. But what comes out of his mouth, that's what makes him unclean. And just a further little bit on down, ver in, uh, uh, chapter, uh, sorry, verse 16, Jesus said this to the people that he was talking to you. Are you still so dull? <laughs> Jesus, our Savior, said that. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. 
Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then comes out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. I'm glad he said it. <laughs> Be careful of what you allow to live in your heart. Be careful of what you allow to live in your heart. What is in your heart becomes very hard to hide. What is in your heart becomes very hard to hide. It will, at some point, get noticed <laughs> by others. The whole point of this sermon, the words that you speak are most often evidence of what is in your heart, good and or not good. And so I'm suggesting that our hearts need to be directed by the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is your life directed by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or is it by our own flesh? Are the very words that come out of you and me directed by Jesus? Or is it, in fact, just me? My advice would be to depend on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can tame the tongue. The Holy Spirit can change what is in your heart. And I wish I had time because there is Scripture support for what I just said. Most of you probably already know it. On, on the one hand, my hope is that this message hasn't been too much on the negative side of things for, for, for us. Uh, uh, that I, I don't want to be negative. I, I don't. Then again, how much more positive can I be by giving you hope in Jesus? How much more positive can I be by giving you hope in Christ and letting you know that this Holy Spirit is still in the business of changing people for His good? My prayer is that just any glory goes to, goes to the Lord right now. Um, would you stand with me as I just... Uh, I'm going to close in a, in a prayer. And, then, and uh, so I'll have the worship team uh, come up as we're, as we're praying. And just to get ready, you can play your last song. And then, uh, uh, Bernard, if you would just come up and, and, and close things. Lord, may the very words that we speak be from you. If our words truly are evidence of what is in our hearts, then the prayer is that it is you, Jesus, that it is indeed in our hearts. If not, then change our hearts and let the changes be known by the words that we say. Psalm 19 and 14 says this, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God and my Redeemer. Amen.